What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas, and it is Monday, so that means we are diving behind the scenes in the fantasy football industry. Another great guest lined up, as they've all been so far. We have Mr. Curtis Patrick, or C. Patrick NFL, on Twitter. He is the, make sure I get this right, the Dynasty Coordinator, Marketing and Social Media Director for RotoViz, newly appointed um, just as of the last month or two months so congratulations on the new position there he is also the co-founder over at the dynasty command center and of course the co-host of their podcast the dynasty command center pod which is quickly becoming uh, a staple in my podcast rotation he was also the lead dynasty writer over at pro football focus so he's well versed in the industry he's got a lot going on um, both from a content creation standpoint and uh, experience from the business side of things so i'm super excited to have you today curtis welcome to the show and uh, let, my, let my guests know a little bit about yourself and what you got going on and, and your history in, inside fantasy football. Wow, that's, that's a great intro. Thanks, Nick, man. Appreciate it. Uh, just to clear that up, uh, I, I am, as of like a month ago, no longer with uh, Pro Football Focus, but I was there for the last two years. Um, so yeah, I, I'll just kind of go into how I got into fantasy and um, what brought me to, to this point, I guess. So I started playing fantasy baseball probably when I was like, 12 or 13 or something this is like late 90s and uh I don't even really know how I got into it. we like act like a baseball card magazine where you could like <laughs> this is like before it was super easy to do anything on the internet if you can rewind that far back a lot of your uh, crowd might not be able to relate to that but anyway just the idea of building teams and being in charge of something at a younger age was like really cool uh, and I always liked statistics it was always a, a data junkie and uh, so I got hooked on fantasy baseball. And then when I got into college, um, I, I went to Marshall University. And uh, it was when Byron Leftwich was there. Uh, so if any of you have been playing football long enough, it was like right after Randy Moss and Chad Pennington. And the football was just so, so big there. Uh, go herd. And that's what really got me into fantasy football. And uh, played that for a couple years. Been doing Dynasty now for probably about 12 or 13 years. Um, and I think I've been creating content for about four years now. And that is, I think going from not creating to actually creating, make, bridging that gap between playing and helping others play, that's like the, the, the biggest, hardest thing to do. Because even when there's opportunities out there, like I just saw like two weeks ago, DLF, Dynasty League Football, great website, was saying like, hey, we want to hire new people. And it's just you know, I've talked to people in my DMs, hey, what should I do? Well, you should put your application in, dummy. I mean, like, just just put your name out there, just start writing. And, uh, but that feels like such like a critical decision for so many people. Like, what if people don't like what I write or if I sound stupid? And, and you're just gonna have to, to start doing it. And so um, my first piece actually was, let me see, summer of 2016 or 15. My first piece that I ever wrote um, was about Vance McDonald, of all people, and it hey. was for RotoViz. And I had some had some buddies that that wrote over there, and it was one of those things where I'm just like, "Hey, would you have these guys look at it? And it, and if it's any good, maybe they'll maybe they'll publish it, and we can go from there." And and that's what happened. So you just kind of put yourself out there and say, you know what, uh, hey, universe, here I am, and and you do it. And if somebody doesn't like it, big deal. Like you can write it again. But they like that piece. And so I wrote uh, that entire football season at Rotoviz. Then I spent a year at DLF. That's when I met Ryan McDowell. And of course, Ryan's my, my partner at uh, Dynasty Command Center. And, and, and really, we do a, a lot of different uh, fantasy business things together. And, and then even just playing the game, we're always constantly challenging each other there. Um, and so that, that was a really key relationship for me. And, and we've become very good friends over the past couple of years. Then I, then I got into Pro Football Focus, Scott Barrett. Uh, a really good buddy of mine uh, that we've been playing in a league together. Um, Elite Lemonade. We, maybe if we have time uh, during this discussion, we can talk a little bit about Elite Lemonade. Okay. Um, but Scott uh, hooked me up uh, with, with a gig at Pro Football Focus. Spent a couple years there. And then it's just funny how things work, man. Like I've come full circle and I'm back at Rotoviz. Um, but now instead of being like um, the total noob that was like, hey, would you pretty please read my piece and put it on your site? Um, now I'm a part owner in the company. And uh, so it's just, you know, things can happen quickly if, if, you, if you grind and you just have that confidence and you don't really worry about what people are going to think. You know, you just get out there and do it. Yeah, so that was a good background. I thought uh, two things were, were kind of funny in there. I like how you mentioned, like, I, I don't know if, you're, uh, if your audience will be old enough to remember this because you saw the, uh, the Twitter poll I put out 
like last week or two weeks ago asking how many cups of coffee people drink, you know, in, in a random day. And like 45% of the answers came back as zero cups of coffee, which was just blasphemy. I don't know. I, like, you're right. I guess my audience is probably like 16 and under <laughs> a lot of them, which is fine because I'll let yeah. you guys take the yeah. older crew. I'll grab the younger demographic and we'll, we'll grow together. Um, I also think it's funny that your first piece was on Vance McDonald. So you have to be waiting patiently for his, his breakout to coming, uh, to come in 2019. So you can retweet that piece, huh? Oh yeah. I, I mean, at this point, you know, he's not with the 49ers. Like when I wrote that, it was literally that, um, basically he had the draft capital tied to his name and, and they didn't really have, I, I think they had other big needs that, that made it seem like, uh, he was a player that would get a shot. He would at least get a shot. So go get him for free. He was available on the waiver wire and it, it just kind of became one of those things. I, I think I actually, I didn't see anybody use it before me, but everybody Vance now, which is what you see on social media anytime Vance McDonald does anything positive. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that came from me. I, I really, I really am. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, yeah, that, you know, um, I think this is a good a year as any for him to break out and, and, and I would love to see it happen. But um, yeah, humble beginnings, man. That's funny. I'll, uh, I'll definitely go back and read that piece if you get it back out on the <laughs> internet. Uh, but let's let's transition away from players more into you know the industry itself and what you got going on business wise. Yeah. Now the new position you announced uh, a month or so ago or two months was with RotoViz, and again it was as the Dynasty coordinator, marketing, and social media director. Now, when people think about getting into the fantasy industry, you think about being a content creator, and for the most part, people are like, "Oh, I want to," you know, "I would love to be in the fantasy industry," and, and they probably think of being a blogger and and writing articles all day about fantasy football players and just analysis and stats and numbers like that. Now at, with that position, with that title, you know, obviously there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes with the businesses that are running in the industry, you know? Um, so can you kind of break down what exactly that title means? Like, what are you doing for RotoViz as the social media coordinator? Um, what does your like day to day look like? I'm sure it's not just writing articles for RotoViz because those are, uh, you know, you have other people doing that while you're running your systems. Yeah, yeah sure. So, so first off, I'm actually not, I'm not even full-time. Um, I, this is, this is okay. an extremely passionate, uh, side hustle that probably could be full-time. Um, but I, I'm doing it as an accessory right now because, um, I've kind of got these two things going and, um, I think I'm like a year or two away from being able to fully supplement or I, I guess, uh, replace the income expectations that I have. Okay. Um, and so that, that might actually be a point, um, for many of you, you know, you, you may have to do this as an extra thing. It's extra work. You're done with your nine to five or whatever else it is that you're doing and then put in that time in. But um, yeah, the, actually, I would say only about half of the time that I spend on fantasy is actually on on research and content creation right now. Um, and, and my day job, I've got a double master's MBA uh, and HCA. And so I know a lot about what it takes to, to run a business, um, the legal side of things, the regulatory side of things, um, and, and just executive leadership acumen. So I think that's something, I, something I'm able to bring to the table in the fantasy community because a lot of these smaller companies, it's just guys that were really smart at, when it comes to fantasy football. And being a good writer doesn't mean that you understand the logistics of how to make things go. And so I think it's a really good point that you made um, there's, there's way more than just one way, um, to get paid, um, in any, any, t uh, type of sports role, whether it's fantasy or, or otherwise, maybe you're a great graphic designer, um, or maybe you've been a shift supervisor at your fast food job, um, you know, on the weekends, just anything. If you've been in charge of people or in charge of processes, or you have any type of unique talent that could be your in. Um, my, my day to day right now, in terms of what I'm doing uh, with fantasy, probably first and foremost, Rotoviz, we're undergoing a full site, uh, overhaul and, and a rebranding initiative. So, you know, we've always been kind of the site of, you know, data first, um, trust the process, uh, zero RB was made, um, popular mm -hmm. in, in part by, um, our, our main owner, Sean Siegel, yep. uh, had a lot of success and, and some major contests with that. And so uh, that stuff's important. The heritage is important. So many great names have come through here, but I think it's time to almost kind of reannounce who we are and what we are. And so um, several times a night, I mean, we're just getting together as, as owners, looking at what's the site design looking like right now, what are the important tools um, and who are the people that we need in our team 
in order to develop those things. So that's another in for you right there. Um, if, if you are good uh, and are shiny or anything like that, um, you might not know how to write, but you might know how to compile uh, or slice up data and help people that are talented writers um, get the access to the numbers that they need to write something compelling. Um, and so, so we have a bunch of us with different backgrounds, different talents and, and passions working on that initiative. And um, so a couple hours a day that I'm spending on that, I've got to meet some really great people um, just in the last six to eight weeks as part of this process. You know, we've got a, uh, a marketing deal with the FFPC. So I've been speaking with their leadership and, and Yahoo Sports. Um, we're, we're getting ready to launch some things with them that are, that are really, really exciting. Uh, and so it just, it's great. So I'm doing just as much, probably, uh, relationship building as much as anything else. Um, and haven't even been able to write as much as I was, uh, when I was at PFF, I also spend whew, an hour to two a day, probably out of all the conversations that I have and what I'm doing at dynasty command center. And so that's, um, that's a Slack based business that Ryan McDowell and I built. And it's kind of started out as just a way to give people better advice. So like if you're ever somebody that has asked an analyst a question on Twitter, then they give you like a two word answer. You don't know anything about your league or your team, or maybe you phrase your question poorly and they just ignore it. We wanted a way to dig deeper and teach people how to play. And so um, we were both familiar with Slack from our time at uh, DLF, um, they had some conversations in there that, that mostly business related, but we thought, you know, why not build a business out of that model? And uh, we, we took some things that uh, we thought we could emulate from the Power Hour uh, podcast. If any of you are big DFS players, they were kind of the ones that put, I think, Slack-based business on the map. And, and I'm friends with uh, John Proctor and Ryan Hodge that started that. And it was just, hey, let's just do the same thing, but Dynasty. Right. Um, and it would have to look way different, obviously. But uh, so anyway, we've got a couple dozen channels in there and people blowing up our DMs all the time. We actually ended up hiring. I think we got five people that we pay, you know, a cut of we, what we take in every month um, to help <laughs> us manage that community. So um, hours and hours a day for sure spent on on fantasy, but it's a hodgepodge of things. And then when I have time to write, I get around to writing. Yeah, it it, it kind of stinks like, um, as I'm trying to expand my team, there's, there's so many things that you just said there that I want to get into. Um, so we're going to get sidetracked yeah. for a minute. Now you were talking about how, like, there are a lot of positions available in the, in the fantasy community. It doesn't necessarily, you don't need to be a fantasy writer. And as I'm trying to expand my team, right? Like I have a, a video editor that's, that's working for me now that I actually pay. Um, but I also have all these other pieces. Like I have someone that helps me with graphic design. I have someone who helps, uh, create the actual content. I have someone that literally goes in and make sure like my YouTube um, descriptions, keywords, and those things are in there as well as transfers it to an audio file, uploads it to podcasting. So there's a lot of these random things behind the scenes. So if you're trying to get your foot in the door in the industry, you don't necessarily have to be like in, in the trenches writing about stuff. You could take what your expertise are and translate that to a business. And what you said, like you have a lot of background in, in, uh, in like the business side of things. And as we see more brands and businesses pop up in the industry, I bet you could like take on the role of being like the go-to business consultant within the fantasy football industry. And that could be like a great side hustle for you, whether it's like for a business like me, a brand that's slowly growing, but looking to get more into like, you know, I just started out a YouTube channel, but before I know it, I'm going to have to start dealing with things that are more legal and more formal and I'll have nowhere else to turn to yeah. except for someone like you. So as the industry grows, there will be tons of opportunities for people like that that understand how to take their expertise and just throw it into a niche. Now, what exactly do you do for your, your actual work outside of fantasy? I'm a healthcare executive. I actually run a, a cardiovascular service line at a large healthcare organization. So it's, it's definitely a job that uh, it's probably a 60 hour a week job anyway. So um, I, I burned the candle at both ends, man. Um, but I, I love what I do and I, I'm bored if I'm not, if I'm not running every minute of the day. So okay. it's great to be able to be working on my phone, even if I'm relaxing, which is what's great about fantasy football. Okay. Um, now you, you talk about how you guys are doing like a total rebrand for Rotoviz. Yeah. Branding, branding is something I'm super passionate about. Just the, uh, the idea of, you know, branding is not like a logo design or the website design specifically. Branding is, is like the story behind who you are and what your brand is and, and the feeling that you give your community 
when they come to your page or your site or whatever. So you did mention that you guys are doing like a website design or a website redesign and stuff. And that's part of your rebrand. But like, what do you guys see as the, as the bigger picture? Cause when I think of Rotoviz, I think of like very analytical. I think of a lot of awesome, useful apps and things like that. Is that the same kind of trend you're still going along or are you guys, you know, have something else in mind in terms of rebranding? No, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's still who we are. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of innovation in terms of new, uh, new tools and apps. And I think there's also, I, I felt, I felt like this company, uh, probably in, around 2017, it, it fell behind a little bit. And, and that's a good point in, in the fantasy industry. If you're not, if you're not always trying to grow, um, or if you go through a period of transition where you're not as confident and you're not shouting from the rooftops that we're still here and we're, we're still an option. It's, it's easy to get passed by. I mean, it's yeah. like every three, four months that there's a, a new company starting up, somebody that was somewhere small and they want to start their own offshoot or whatever. And I think, I think Rotoviz fell a little bit victim to that. They went, under, went an ownership change at the top um, and, and Sean bought the company and, and wanted to really just focus on the, uh, the fantasy side of things for a year and, and just lay that foundation and make sure that he had a good writing team that he trusted and and he did a great job of doing that. And it really set the tone um, for, for where we're at now, which is uh, we really like the people that are there. Um, it feels like there's a lot of buy-in into what the vision is. But now we have to reconnect ourselves to teaching people about the tools we have. How, how can you practically apply them? Because honestly, any site you go to has some type of tool at this point, or they have an agreement with another site that has tools. Yep. And that, it's not, it's not unique to provide data. I mean, data is everywhere. Um, and if you're willing to pay uh, a reasonable fee, you can get access to basically anything historical uh, or live up to date uh, scoring and, and uh, statistics that you want. So it's, where's the value in the, for, in it for the subscriber is, can you make it easy enough for them to understand if I see this in the data, then I do this. Right. And that's what it really boils down to. And so I want our team to focus on teaching through writing. I don't think that, you know, a 2000 word fantasy article, unless it's a reference piece on strategy that uh, would teach you maybe how to adjust during an auction or something. I, I just don't think there's any place for that. I mean, the dynasty uh, in the off season can change month to month um, and, and redraft with lineup setting and, and injuries and waivers. It changes week to week to week. So I think short, easy to digest content um, that is rooted in some sort of tangible uh, and easily accessible research. That's that's where Rotoviz is going, okay. and we want to cite you know we want to cite that reflects that. Um, I want to go back to what you said about brand. I mean, brand is the most important thing by far. Yeah. So brand, brand, if you don't know who you are, if you don't if you don't know who you are, you don't have a brand. First of all. Um, and your brand is more important than anything. It's more important than anyone else that works for you or any of those relationships. If you veer off of what your brand is or you forget what your brand is, you're done. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite uh, kind of sages um, in business is Gary Vaynerchuk. I don't know if you've ever watched any of his stuff, but I would, uh, for where you're at, yeah. Okay. I've been following Gary V for, he's like legitimately the reason I, I left my job two years ago. For like four years, I've been okay. I, his word is law. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Well, uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, cause I, you know, I don't know. I, he's, he's very big, but you don't know who who's into that. Um, but he talks so much about, uh, branding and, um, being action oriented. And I think in anything that is social media, um, connected and fantasy football is very social media connected. I mean, look how successful you've been able to be building up a, a really large following on YouTube, basically by nothing except your own sweat. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, and then where can it go from there? Uh, you can't get lazy. You got to keep putting stuff out there, but you've, your, your BDGE. I mean, like I didn't, before I even knew who you were, like I had seen that logo. And I, I mean, I think um, you put that on everything that you do. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's part of branding. It's anytime we do anything, it's, it's this, company this entity this person um and a company it, it isn't the only type of brand a person's a brand right like when i think of somebody like matt Harmon, who i think you've had on there or you're gonna have on there yeah he's next he was somebody he was 
yeah, he was somebody who was able to, he almost had like his own personal brand that was like separate from whoever he was writing with. Yeah. And, he, you know, it was, um, you know, wide receiver charting basically and uh, some sort of gross vegetable. I can't remember if it was Brussels sprouts <laughs> or something. He, he had like two things that people love to talk about. Uh -huh. And it was like, okay, he's that guy. Um, and, you know, that, that works. Uh, that absolutely works. So uh, if you're at a point where you don't know what you are, what you want to be, it doesn't have, you don't have to offer everything. Like be good at like one thing and then don't be afraid to show your personality and then you'll figure out what your brand is. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to show your personality nowadays. Like you said, I mean, um, any website that's fantasy football related nowadays is going to offer some kind of data, whatever. They're going to have their algorithms and they're this and they're that. And what separates people, like when you're selling your service or your product, it's, it, there's like only four or five things in the world that, that make people buy something. It's, it's, it's these feelings. It's not the actual product, right? It's like feeling connected, yeah. saving you time. It's convenience. It's community. It's, you know, it's one of those four or five things that when you're trying to sell something, mm -hmm. that's what you're selling. You're not actually selling the end product. You're selling the feeling. So if you're only selling like your physical product, that's not going to work, which is why branding is so big. And I would argue now that personal branding is far more important than business branding. I think they can kind of work one in the same, but it's a reason I've wrestled with myself by like my YouTube channel yeah. is still my name. And I don't think I'll ever change it to, to big dogs got to eat because I just like the, the the feeling of having that as like a personal thing to me. You know, I don't want to be known as like a fantasy football analyst. I want to be known as as Nick Ercolano, someone who does this and does that and, and provides value in a number of ways. I could change my YouTube channel name and it would probably be way better for like SEO purposes and bringing in more people because the name would have fantasy football in it. But when I look at long term and I will, when I look at my goals, that's not what I want. You know, I, I want to be my own personal brand. I want I want people to think of me that way. So um, personal brand, business brand, they're, they're both ridiculously important and they're how you separate yourself nowadays. Um, and, and I think you, you said before, like, you know, maybe you're a year, two years away from going full time with fantasy. And I would argue that you're, you're probably, whatever your projection is, you're probably closer to it because you're in such a good niche in dynasty. Um, and that is just starting to really hit the mainstream. Right. And I want to talk to you about Dynasty. I know you said you've been playing for a long time and that, that was always like a passion of yours, I guess. And, and now it's kind of coming to fruition where uh, there's a lot of people getting more and more interested in it. So like, where do you see Dynasty fantasy football fitting into the whole the industry itself? Because we have season long, which is always going to be a part of it because that's like the connection, you know, that that's, that's a really strong part of, of fantasy football. Then there's also like best ball, there's DFS, there's people that just play for money and that kind of stuff. Um, so where do you see like dynasty fitting in is, do you think it's like taking over? It's going to be like the number one type of game or. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think as long as daily fantasy is here, it's, I think it's going to be King because it just gives you that quick payoff. Like that dynasty is not for everyone because it's, it's a, it's an, a game for an investor. I mean, you know, a move that I make in February, I might not know how great that move was for nine months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's really not for everyone in, unless you're playing higher stakes. But I think that um, what is changing is I, I'm, I'm really sensing a lot of people um, getting into dynasty and then playing DFS and abandoning redraft. Mm. Like I think, I think the big movement is best ball replacing traditional redraft, um, at least amongst volume players. And then Dynasty and DFS being kind of that perfect marriage of I get the instant feedback and I still get to have skin in the game every week. I have access to any player I want. If I'm sick of this other guy, he's not on my roster anymore, I'll just pay 8500 for Zeke this week, um, which is the beauty of DFS. But in Dynasty, I can, I can build and cultivate that specific team and, and feel like I'm the king. And that's, that's what it is. That's what it's about. I mean, Dynasty is the GM experience. Um, I think within Dynasty, the trend is to include uh, a Devi aspect. Um, I'm seeing more and more of that, which is for those of you, if you're not familiar with Devi, um, it's where you actually start to roster some college players before they enter the league. And you can put, you know, usually that's, it's that's anywhere so from like, yeah, it, it is, but it's anywhere from like two to eight players. And so you actually have a Devi draft. You don't have a rookie draft. You have a Devi draft. So you're drafting like freshman and sophomore in college. And it's really weird, like the first year or two. Mm -hmm. But then it's great because it gets you more interested in the college game. 
And then with last year with college DFS coming back, I think people are getting more used to tracking all the college rosters. And so that, that marriage has been carried down to the college level too. So um, I don't think that any, any one, there, there's no like one size fits all in fantasy football, which is what's so great. And you can, that even carries into the player analysis. Like you can love a player for 2019 and still like push them way down your dynasty board. And so you might want exposure to them in one format and want to fade them in another. Um, but, but to go back to the original question, I don't think dynasty is necessarily in, in takeover mode. I do think where it could take over would maybe be in, in leagues where you actually have to set a lineup. I think that's where dynasty could eventually take over because of the options of DFS and the options of best ball and um, not having to care as much about the waiver wire and dynasty because you're rostering 25, 30 players. Um, I do feel that it's grown immensely even in the last four years since I've been an analyst. Um, it used to be that it was DLF and then every other site kind of had their dynasty analysis, but I feel like there's so much more content between January and June now than there was even like back in 2015. Yep. A lot of it's aimed at the NFL draft and the NFL draft can, continues to get more and more mainstream. I mean, they put it on network television for the first time last year, I think. But so much of the reason why people in fantasy care about the NFL draft is the dynasty aspect, where are these people going to be ranked as rookies. And so I think the more that dynasty can play into that and maybe not nerd out quite as much, um, if, you can make, if you can make dynasty appealing and accessible to people who are only used to playing one team a year and only used to having 15 players on their team, make it fun and interesting for somebody that wants to get into it instead of kind of um, nerding out to the level where you're just talking to yourselves and you're in a little niche. I think that's, that's the danger in dynasty. Um, and, and something that I always want to drive us away from. Yeah, I hear you. There's, there's so much potential with dynasty and this just goes to the point though, over the last few years, I would say like dynasty has grown exponentially compared to where it's been over the last like 10 years. And I think we're going to see it go, you know, that way as the next year, two years passes by, um, and, and like it, it is a little intimidating for people who have never played it before, but like you have best ball also kind of blowing up and there will be, I'm sure another yeah. format that somehow kind of comes in and does that. And it just opens up a lot of opportunities <laughs> for people out there to become like the go-to person for it or the go-to brand for it, or to just start writing about that specific strategy. And, um, and, and with like dynasty, the, the tough part about it is, um, well, without Dynasty, the tough part about like fantasy from a business or branding perspective is trying to monetize in the off season, right? Because there's like yep. six or seven months that you can't yep. really do anything. Dynasty, if that does become mainstream, you're going to have a lot of people zoned in and really paying attention to everything uh, throughout the off season. And I'm, I've been putting out content, you know, since the season stopped, probably five videos a week, like nonstop. And I don't plan on stopping all the way through the season, you know, now it's like, if I don't do that, my competition is getting far ahead of me. It's like, I need to do that just to yep. stay where I'm at and, and continue to grow. And like, if you don't have that mindset, like if you're putting out one video right now, like I'm going to beat you because I'm going to be putting out five videos. And that's, you know, if you're not ready to do that, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have your work cut out for you. So like, talk to me about um, the Dynasty Command Center podcast, because like I said, like I meant that that is one of my staple rotations for Dynasty football in terms of podcasting, because there are not a lot of content there's not a lot of content creators out there that are specifically zoned in on dynasty there are a lot of redraft um channels and, and podcasts like myself that kind of sprinkle in dynasty here and there and they'll talk about it throughout their redraft analysis but you guys are solely mm -hmm. focused on dynasty for um for that podcast now is that uh was that like when you set out you were like let's just do only dynasty for this podcast and, and really take over and become the go-to yeah, I, well, that that's I mean, that, there's some layers in that question. So yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So so the Dynasty Command Center um, came first, and that again, that's um, like we talked about at the beginning of the show. That's the the Slack community that is right. where me, Ryan McDowell, Travis May, T.J. Calkins, uh, Tom Kislingberry, and some others. Um, you know, we're actually trying to teach people how to play. We're helping them run their team as if we were running it. It's not not a consultant situation we're not actually doing things for them but they're actually coming hey here's my squad here's how I did last year here's all my settings do you see any obvious moves or you know they might even say you know here's the rosters of every team in my league what should we do can you uh, um, real quick it, for, for people that probably a lot of the audience doesn't know what you mean by like a slack-based business or slack-based business 
Yeah, sure. So, so Slack is just, it's a communication tool. Uh, it's an app that anyone can download. Um, if you've used, oh, let me think of, hold on. I'm just going to pull up my phone here it's while like, we're talking. Yeah, it's like a messaging have, app. Uh, think of AIM or something. Yeah, it's a messaging app like GroupMe, if you've used GroupMe before. But it's catered uh, or if you've businesses, used pretty much. Boxer, um, which is, you know, voice-based. But yeah, but the thing that's really unique about Slack is it, it's actually conducive to creating businesses because mm -hmm. you can create private channels um, where not everyone who has access to like the, the main channel um, has access to these other ones. Um, and you can create separate things where it's just like the staff or the team talking that nobody else has access to. So it can kind of become like the repository for everything you're doing within the business. And it's just, what am I going to work on right now? All right, well, let me see what channel uh, has some messages. So like I have DCC pulled up right now. I have like 150 messages. So I guess I know what I'm doing when we're done recording here. But um, so, so yeah, if, if you've never checked Slack out, it's free to download and you can actually host a pretty big business on it without, there you go, without um, paying an extraordinary amount of money. Um, really the only time you have to start paying significant money in Slack is if you want to protect all the historical messages. So I think it's something after like 10,000 or something, if you want everything to be searchable, yeah. Depending on the size of your community, you pay like, so where we're at right now, it costs us in five figure territory to protect all of our messages. So Jeez. we're not going to ever be doing that. Yeah. Um, it's not, not a, a good cost decision for, for us. But so anyway, Dynasty Command Center runs out of that slack, but we wanted to take a lot of the same principles and some of the content that we share in there and make it available to the public. Because if, and this is, I think a good business principle, if you're somebody who is, is trying to monetize yourself in fantasy, if you start charging people right away for everything, people aren't going to know about you. Um, you have to give people something so they'll want more than that something. Um, and and also, it just doesn't feel like no one's going to know about you if if there's nothing that they can retweet that everyone can see or that they can share on Facebook or say, hey, go listen to this thing. If if you've got a Patreon for your pod and people have to pay to listen to it, you know that's great if you're already big. But if you're starting out, it's better to just put it out there on the airway. I mean, some of the biggest podcasts, I mean, forget fantasy, like you can go listen to Joe Rogan for free. Joe Rogan could charge whatever he wanted for that pod yep. and he make millions more and people would pay it. But he doesn't uh, because he understands uh, the power of what it can do for him in the other areas of his businesses. So, um, you know, we're not we're not a huge podcast. I mean, we're getting uh, usually three to five thousand listens an episode at this point, which is. Um, I think solid, but we certainly have room to grow, but we're only 12 episodes in as well. As yeah. you mentioned, it's a pretty new pod. So we try to rotate through our different analysts. We want to teach people about dynasty. Uh, I, I think that we, with the, that we will become the best dynasty pod that's out there, uh, because we wouldn't do it if we didn't think that we were going to be that, um, we're not going to go through the motions and just input an episode out there. We, we have show sheets, uh, and, and critique what's going to be talked about in, in every show. Um, we do actually don't bring guests on because uh, for something where you're trying to teach people uh, about a certain thing that night, a guest introduces all kinds of variables that you can't solve for necessarily. And so if we want to tell people about, you know, I think our episode that will post tonight is about super flex rookies. That's just me and Travis because we know exactly what we wanted people to take away from that episode. If somebody throws you a big curveball, now you're off track and you missed the target for your audience. So that's a little bit about the strategy in that pod. Uh, we also wanted to be a little different in that we're trying not to go like an hour with our podcasts. You know, I think every pod seems like it's 60 to 90 minutes. We, you know, we want to try to stay between 30 and 45 minutes just because there are so many choices. Mm -hmm. Are people going to dedicate a half an hour a week or half an hour a couple times a week just to Dynasty? Well, if they love it enough, but if they don't love it enough, they're going to skip right over us if it takes too long. Or they're going to listen on double speed and and miss out. <laughs> and that's not yeah. what we want people to do. So. Um, hopefully I got to most of your questions there. You did. I, I honestly forgot like what I asked in the beginning, but you went on for a while. So, <laughs> so I'm sure it covered most of it. Yeah. I actually appreciate that you guys do the 30 minute episodes. I mean, there are, you know, you know, it, it's very subjective, I guess. Like I, I listened to, um, 
you know, the Roto Underworld with Matt Kelly and his episodes oh, yeah. start to hit like 75, 80 minutes sometimes. I'm like, okay, I'm cool with that. But there's not a lot of podcasts out there that can, that can keep you engaged and entertained for that long. And especially with the way people's like attention spans are nowadays, it's very hard mm-hmm. to keep them entertained. So I think you guys are perfect with the 30, 35 minute mark. Um, I'm completely engaged like the entire time you guys are talking with a ton of valuable information. So keep doing what you guys are doing. And I, I, I definitely agree with you that you'll probably be the biggest dynasty podcast or definitely the most like valuable and informational, um, especially for, you know, like you guys dive into the rookies that most people don't even know about, but also break the game down. So like, you can understand dynasty, you know, if you're getting into the game and how to value certain players, how to value picks and, and things like that. So this is a phenomenal podcast for anyone that's like new into dynasty or has been around for a while. Now I know you guys have this, um, this, this rookie guide pretty much this dynasty guide that you guys have three parts for. Mm. Um, and I'm not sure which part you're really on right now, but this is a, a product that you guys have created to obviously help monetize the podcast along with like the sponsorships you have going on. So kind of give us a breakdown of like what this rookie draft guide is um, that, that you have offered to your audience. Sure. So the rookie guide came out uh, last year was our first year doing it. So it would have been winter, I guess, December, like 2017 is when the first um, our first ever guide dropped. And Ryan and I were, were really talking about, all the rookie analysis is out there, but everyone's not everyone is a strong word. Most of the companies that are highly reputable seem hesitant to put the content out there uh, and put a stamp on it until all the players have declared for the draft. And until we have combine measurables and, and I really sensed uh, an opportunity an opening in the market there. So, you know, we started work in October of 2017 uh, putting that guide together. And our goal was we want to release by Christmas because bowl season, um, we're kind of in a dead spot of the NFL season where it's like, you know, you get into week 16, 17, you get championship week and everybody but two, you know, two players in the league are eliminated. And I mean, you can say you care who wins your league, but if it's not you, yeah. um, you, you're probably not too invested and, and you're probably not too happy for the guy that ends up winning it anyway. Um, and so we we thought that was the perfect time to put something new and get people excited about the season to come. Um, and and so that's what we did. And we didn't we didn't worry about being perfect. We didn't worry about, well, what if we rate this guy number 12 and he doesn't even declare for the draft? All right, well, you know about that player a year early now. Mm-hmm. And we replace him with another another player in volume two. And and that that worked really well for us because there's some great rookie guides out there already. Matt, Matt Waldman has a huge audience with his, mm-hmm. uh, and some of the major sites put out rookie guides, and and we we knew that we couldn't overtake them simply because of you know who we were as analysts. I mean we're well liked, but you know we don't necessarily have the audiences of you know Matthew Barry and Mike Clay at ESPN. Um, so putting something out when nobody had anything else to buy. That was the key thing for us. And, and we did very well in our first year. Um, this year, uh, we actually tripled our pre-sales uh, in year two versus year one, um, which was fantastic. And I feel like the contents, I mean, it's even better this year. The first year, we kind of did the same thing that everyone does, put out the little, you know, 300-word blurb on each player with this, like, a whole prospect profile. That mm-hmm. stuff's great, but it doesn't really mean anything, usually, in terms of how they're going to produce in the NFL. And so we try to strip it down, include a lot more graphics, make it more rankings and tiers based, and then include a lot more strategy. Like how do we think about the rookie class? Um, How do you approach a PPR dynasty draft versus a super flex versus a tight end premium? It's the practical application of it instead of knowing that so-and-so's wingspan is an eighth inch short. Um, We felt like that was more more important for our audience or we want our audience to perceive that as more important. So right. it's like, um, it's like teaching them, you know, it's like you can catch a fish for somebody or you could teach them how to fish. It, it's more yeah. strategy yep. and that stuff. Um, and that's, that's something I'm, I'm doing too. Cause I've, this is the first year I've actually, I offered like a rookie dynasty guide as well. Uh, and I want to get into like the logistics of how you guys actually put your guide together, like where you house it and things like that. But uh, one of the okay. things I tried to focus on too, I'm like, Listen, like you guys over there will give better analysis on on Dynasty um, and, and on the rookies because you've been watching them for a while. You're playing like Debbie Leagues and you know way more about that. So I don't want to sell people on the fact that like, listen, you're going to get the best analysis on the players. I want to have articles in that draft guide that I won't put out elsewhere that are going to help you be a better Dynasty player and, you know, help you 
get better picks. And like one of the things I'm doing an exclusive article in that is uh, I, and I actually have to DM you after this about this, but uh, I'm basically asking a lot of, you know, the bigger influencers in the space that play dynasty. Uh, what is your, what is your like top tip? Uh, as a dynasty player for people either getting into it or like what's one of your biggest takeaways from dynasty about how to improve yourself as a player overall i'm going to put together like 30 or 40 tips from you know the, the the best minds in the industry and put that as an exclusive article so i think like when you're thinking about a product or service to offer if if you're thinking if the first thing that comes to your mind is like okay what do they do we should do that too you're probably looking in the wrong direction yeah so start, yeah so try, to, try to you know make yourself unique try to fade the public as we say over here at the hq um, but let me, let me hear about the draft guide that you put together because last year I did it through a software called flip snack where it was like a, literally like an online magazine and you flip the pages and it was cool, but it was a pain in the ass to put together this year. I'm doing it on a website called wix.com, which is, you know, Squarespace. You probably heard about some of these, uh, you know, members of the audience, it's just a place to build your website and it gives, um, access to people who purchased a certain plan. So let me hear about like how you guys have it set up on your end. Yeah, so we, uh, we actually have a graphic designer that, that builds it uh, for us, and we distribute it in PDF form rather than hosting it online. Okay. Um, and we do that for a couple of reasons. The first, the first year that we did it, we found that so many people were actually printing it off. So if we were to protect it somewhere and not allow people to download it, um, I, I mean, are you only going to really allow people to, to look at what you've created for them and what they bought with their own money by scrolling around on their, their phone or their device? Um, for some people that might work, but that's not, especially in dynasty. Uh, a lot of the people that play dynasty, I mean, you got people into their fifties and sixties playing dynasty that have been playing for decades like that for them. Like they still, you have to know who your audience is. It's not the same as the DFS audience that, um, you know, is more comfortable only, um, in an online world. And so, uh, the other, you know, the one worry we had was if we put the PDF in people's hands, you know, what stops them from just sharing it with other people? Well, nothing really does stop them. But if the content's good enough, our brand is, um, you know, sprinkled throughout that guide. And if they like that guide, you know, enough, maybe they join our Slack. Maybe they start listening to the pod. Maybe they, they follow us on social. And it helps us grow our audience organically, even though people might be tempted to be dishonest about what they do with the product after they purchase it. So, um you know, in, in terms of hosting it anywhere, that's not what's done. I mean, people just get an automated email uh, with their guide uh, after they purchase it. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, that was similar to what I did last year. And you're, and you're right. That was something that I did not foresee happening as being an issue. There was a lot of people like, how do I, you know, how do I print this? How do I download it? So I didn't realize that, you know, the age range of my audience is anywhere from, you know, 15 who obviously grew up with a phone in their hand to people who are 50 or 60 that don't want to bring a laptop to their draft. So they need to know how to print things out. And yep. um, thankfully the, uh, the, 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 the rankings on like on fantasy pros or whatever come with like a, a printable or downloadable link that I can, um, that I can have, you know, pass over to, to my audience. But that's something I'm going to have to actually think about if people want to print out the, the content that I put within the guide. So that's, that's an interesting viewpoint. It's always thinking about, you know, who you're serving, what key characteristics, you know, whether it's demographic, like you can get, uh, you could talk about the demographic, but you have to actually understand them like as a person and, and you know, what, what their, what their wants and needs are. So it goes a lot deeper uh deeper into that so that's like some of my problems did you guys um run into any like unforeseen problems when you were creating it maybe for the first time that you had to fix the second time around um having earlier deadlines it, it was it was mostly logistic like actually putting the guide together um was a breeze for us because you know we hired somebody that does it professionally you know we didn't try to become experts at creating a digital magazine um there's a, a guy that um has followed us has been a big fan a fantasy fan, I guess, of, of Ryan and I and had offered us services to us before he started building like Twitter banners for people and stuff like that, okay. charging five bucks a pop. And yeah, so we, we came to know guys. him through that. Yeah. And, uh, and then we actually found out that it's what he does for a living. And so, um, yeah, he, he's actually made uh, several thousand dollars of, uh, off of us in the last year, year and a half um, for his design work on multiple projects for us. So again, different ways into the industry, right? All it took was him DMing and offering his services and it grew yep. into a relationship where he's essentially on retainer for me. But um, yeah, we didn't, for, for us it was, okay, here's the deadline of when it needs to release and then reverse engineering 
what are all the checkpoints that need to be in place in order to get it out to your audience and not have them disappointed. And it's impossible to know all the things that go into having a successful release in year one or really even in year two. I think next year will be the first year where it goes off with, without a hitch altogether. But yeah. I was, my biggest worry this year was we had six people contribute. Last year, we only had three people contribute. And so you're trying to get you know, a team that's double the size to turn things in on time. Can we get everything edited? Um, will people listen to the recommended word counts because we learned about how many words fit on a page with the style that we uh, prefer? <laughs> So a lot of that where you just get really nitty gritty, like, yep. okay, here's your topic. And you can either have 800 words or you can have 1600. Do not give me 1200. <laughs> like just stuff like yeah. that, that you wouldn't think about talking about becomes super important. So, um, and then just, you know, and this is, I guess, brand a little bit. Um, but we got like really picky with like what level of gloss and background fade and like, what is, what's the appearance of the guide going to look like? If you do print it off, does it evoke like a high gloss, like high fashion magazine, or is it like the old ESPN, the mags where it's almost that canvassy paper? Um, it's, you know, what does it look like when it's on something physical? And uh, Ryan and I both care about that because we're kind of in that bridge. I think that bridge generation of being in, in our mid thirties. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and so it, that's just, that's something that's unique to us. Other people might not worry about as much. You might not care as much about that, but for us, it's still important. Um, so yeah, most, mostly logistics, I would say. Yeah. And it's funny that you bring that up because that's literally the same thing that I'm going through right now. Like when I put the, the, the season long draft guide together last year, it came out to so many pages and I did the entire thing on my own, like no one helping. And I knew when I was like, okay, I'm going to do the rookie, uh, the rookie dynasty draft guide this year before the season long one. Uh, launches I'm like I'm not going to be able to put that all together myself so I have um, myself and I think three or four other people working on it with me and I, I knew because I've done projects like this before you know kind of managing a team and, and hitting deadlines I, I had told them I was like okay this is when I want it to launch I need you to have it to me or you know in the in the website a few days prior to that I didn't tell them that it was actually going to launch like a week and a half later because I knew that when that launch date came yeah. like that Sunday night before the Monday morning, we're going to have like, Oh, I'm just finishing it up. And I'm like, dude, you can't give me four hours to put this entire guide together. And when they watch this, yeah. they're probably going to laugh because I'm, I'm talking about you know, literally my team. And, and if you looked at my Slack channel, it's like, it's literally me like, yeah, you know what, do this, do this. And you start to get nitty gritty because at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you don't want to, you, you can't put your name on something, your brand on something and expect people to buy it. And then, you know, half ass the job. Right, right, absolutely, and and then and getting people to do it where it, it's just a passion for them. I mean, mm -hmm. I I don't imagine that you're paying them a full time salary, so it's like, all right, guys, we want to be proud of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, exactly, uh, you know, we want to be proud of this, and we have a certain expectation for the quality that's going to be there. Um, and and you know, here's the deadline. We're, we have to act as if we're professional, even though uh, we may or may not be. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's, you know, when you're running the business, it's okay to have those expectations and it's okay, um, to have those demands, even if, you know, you're not paying somebody's benefits yet. Yeah. Um, you, you have to have that aggressive nature about it, or you're not going to end up with what you want in the end. And exactly. that's okay. And these are guys that I've, these are guys that I've vetted for a long time. One of them has been doing content with me for probably like a year now. Uh, the other couple guys I've like been in talks with for a few months now and, you know, I've worked with and seen some of their content and stuff too. So it's not like I just found these guys off Twitter and be like, Hey, do you want to contribute to the draft guy? Like, obviously you don't want to yeah. do that, but at the same time, like you want to find people who are passionate about it because that's what comes through and that's what the audience sees. Now, in order to get it into the audience's hand, right? Like you got to do some type of marketing. Can you explain to me like when you guys, first launched or what you guys got going on now in terms of marketing is it mainly just relying on you know you guys getting on the podcast getting those 3,000 to 5,000 listens telling them to, to to purchase the guide and that's what you guys got going on um, that's that's one way that we do it uh, in the first year we focused more on on trying to leverage relationships with other people in the industry we even invited uh, it was similar to the idea that you're talking about doing for your dynasty guide where well let's have some bigger names participate in this mock draft that we're going to post in the, in the guide. Okay. And then maybe they'll, they'll feel like they want to retweet it um, or mention it on their pod. And it was kind of a mixed bag, honestly. I mean, I think these guys get asked to do so many things that they don't feel compelled necessarily to share everything uh, that they do. 
And so we, we took a little bit of a different strategy, but in year two, people already knew that the guide existed. And so we had an existing customer base that we could go back to and depend on as our foundation. And then word of mouth, word of mouth could, could help with that. But um, Twitter is really important for Ryan and I. I know your primary social medium is YouTube and we don't have much of a presence over there, but between Ryan and I, I mean, Ryan's got over 25,000 Twitter followers and I, I'm at about 11,000 and there's many other people on our team that are between five and 10. And so we have a lot of reach there and a lot of, obviously a lot of our audience overlaps. So those aren't all, you know, you can't just add that follower count up, but um, that's a pretty big uh, foundation to build from when you're, when you're trying to sell something at 20 bucks a pop. And uh, so we started just by re-engaging um, the customers that we sold to last year, letting them know that another guide was coming and, um, and then just pushing it hard on, on Twitter. And then we do try to schedule more podcast appearances on other pods when it's release week. Right. So um, kind of the star of volume two for us was Travis May. He did a wide receiver charting article that was really, really cool. He watched eight full games on a lot of the prospects that we asked him to watch and um, provided some of his um, in-depth analysis on that. And so we tried to get Travis on as many pods as possible um, when this dropped. And with volume one, it was Ryan and I doing that. And we go on each other's extra pods. And, um, you know, I think that you get into most of the reaches of the community from that. So um, it's, it's organic and it's an all hands on deck thing too. Anyone who writes in it needs to be part of helping to market. They've got to extend the brand for you. Yeah. I mean, marketing, there's just so many avenues that you can go with it. Um, and, and prior to, you know, doing content like full time, uh, I was working for uh, a few different e-commerce businesses running like their paid traffic. So like Facebook and Instagram ads. And that's something I'm personally going to uh, get into this summer. And I, I think just the nature of our, our, our niche, like fantasy football is just so engaging to people that you could run these ads and, and run them at like two to three cents a click. And you can get uh, on Facebook advertising. I'm not sure how familiar you are with like the actual interface of it, but you can make these these warm audiences based off if someone watched three seconds of your video or 10 seconds of your video, and you can get those for an unbelievably cheap price, right? And, and once they become a, a warm part of your audience, they're, you know, they recognize you, they recognize your brand, then you can get more into like the sales approach. But these are all different tools. Like, I don't want, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm a YouTuber, right? I'm, I'm someone who uses YouTube as a, as a marketing platform. Mm -hmm. And I'll use Twitter as a marketing platform. And I'll use my email list, like you said, like people who have purchased my, my guide last year, I'll have their email addresses. So then I could hit them up in a month or so and be like, Hey guys, it's on pre-order. Um, and that's like my foundation right there. And you, you'll get like a decent chunk of sales off that. So it's really, you know, business and marketing is just combining all of these different efforts, but at, at the core of everything, it's really providing value and, and, and giving out in, in today's day and age, that's by putting out a lot of content and you guys do it great through podcast and through Twitter and my avenues through YouTube, but it's like, whatever's, you know, second nature to you, whatever makes you comfortable in doing so that's, that's the avenue to take in, in today's world. And I know uh, we probably have to wrap this up because you have another meeting coming up. So we will leave the audience as we always do with one actionable piece of advice from the guest, Mr. Curtis Patrick, what kind of knowledge are you dropping on us? Oh man, that see, see, we could do another hour on this because <laughs> if you just even, if you leave fantasy aside, like life strategy is something that I'm super passionate about too. And, and some of the friends that I made in the fantasy industry would talk a lot about this, but if I'm going to drop one thing, um, just don't be afraid to fail. And I, you know, that would be it in business. If you're trying to get into fantasy or any other type of venture, it could even be actually managing your dynasty football team. Um, you have to get out there and experiment and try different things and find out what works for you. Um, because there, there are tried and true methods, but every person uh, and every person's set of personal experiences is a little bit unique. And the way that, that Nick might do something or way that I might do something or the way that Matthew Barry might do something are just going to look a little bit different. Um, so get out there and try it. And the newer you are, the less experience you have, the more courage it takes. I understand that. Yes. Um, but I promise more people will be impressed when you succeed than will laugh when you fail. And your failures are, are extremely less meaningful to everyone else than they are to you. Yes. Um, so that, that, yeah, that, that's what I, I would uh, leave you with. And the way that I remember to do that in my life, um, and it's kind of a mantra I have with my oldest son, is work hard and stay positive. We've even got the little like uh, rubber bracelets that we wear and remind each other of that. So um, whatever you can do, don't be afraid to fail. 
I love that. All right, that's perfect. So you guys heard it. Make sure that you are following Mr. Curtis Patrick, C. Patrick NFL on Twitter. I will link the podcast. I will link the guide down below. I highly recommend. I don't care that I got a guide out there. Their stuff is, is very, very, very good content. It is valuable for you guys if you're getting into Dynasty or if you're already in the Dynasty scene. Make sure you go check that out. All that stuff will be linked down below. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. Next week's will be Matt Harmon of Yahoo Fantasy Football. So thank you, Curtis, and uh, I, will, I will talk to you later. Sounds great. Thanks again, man.